Hi there. So today I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the basics of scanning electron microscopy because electron microscopy laid the foundation for a lot of what we understand um, about nanoscience. So first of all, let me just talk about some of the differences between light microscopy and electron microscopy. Of course, light microscopy uses optical lenses to focus light down and that is how the image is created. The ultimate resolution of light microscopy, however, is limited by the wavelength of light itself. So you can get some fraction of 400 to 700 nanometers, um, depending upon what kind of microscope you might use. You might be able to get a little bit below 400, but that really is sort of the ultimate limit of what optical microscopy can do. Of course, this is true of any kind of microscopy. Um, the wavelength or size of whatever it is that you're using to look at your surface is going to limit your resolution ultimately. Now, electron microscopy is also limited by the wavelength of electrons. If you remember your introduction to modern physics, you remember that there's a wave-particle duality. And so the wavelength of the electron is going to equal to Planck's constant divided by its momentum, OK? So, um, since electrons are so small, they have a very small mass, um, and if you accelerate them to a nice high speed, then you can get wavelengths that are, you know, decently short, um, and you can achieve actually subatomic resolution um, with electron microscopes. And so this is the main advantage of electron microscopy. It can see things that light microscopy and many other forms of microscopy just can't. That's illustrated here by an SEM image on the right of some gold nanoparticles. Now each one of these gold nanoparticles is about 5 to 10 nanometers in diameter and you can see if you look closely at the electron microscopy image the little um, dots in there are actually the atoms in the nanoparticle. And this was taken with a transmission electron microscope, okay? Now scanning electron microscopy, how it works is it uses electromagnetic lenses to focus electrons into a spot. Now the resolution in scanning electron microscopy is limited by the size of the spot that you can focus it down to. And the ultimate resolution of SEM is a roughly one nanometer because it's difficult to focus the spot down to smaller than that diameter. Other forms of electron microscopy, like transmission electron microscopy, they have higher resolution because it's not necessary to focus the electrons into a spot to take the image. However, scanning electron microscopy has other advantages. In transmission electron microscopy, for example, the electrons have to travel through the specimen, come out the other side. Um, so that means that your sample prep for transmission electron microscopy is a lot higher because you have to uh, slice your sample into very thin sections. And also in transmission electron microscopy, your samples are limited in their um, radius and diameter as well. And so SEM, you can take pretty much whatever you wanted. I mean, if I wanted to, I could stick this pen in there and it would be fine. But um, in transmission electron microscopy, um, the sample prep is much higher. So there's advantages and disadvantages to each technique. For all forms of electron microscopy, though, there's consequences of using electrons as your um, imaging uh, medium. First of all, electrons are charged particles. So all the samples that you have to look at in an SEM, they usually should be conductive, okay? Otherwise, they're gonna charge up. What's gonna happen if you focused it on an insulator like this pen is that the electrons would come down, they would strike the sample. Some of the electrons would get embedded in the sample. They might free electrons within the sample, but either way, your pen's gonna end up charged. Well, if your pen is charged, and you're trying to look at um, your pen with something that has a charge itself. For example, if the pen is negatively charged and the incoming electrons are negatively charged, they're going to repel one another, and your beam is never really going to make it to your sample, which can cause distortion of the image. There's ways to get around this. An environmental SEM, for example, has the ambient pressure a little bit higher and that releases some of the charge, but you are going to always have to think about charging if you're looking at a sample that's non-conductive. So what you do is you have a conductive sample and then you have your conductive sample hooked up to a ground so that any excess charge gets bled off and then you don't have charging on your sample. 
If you want to look at something that's not um, that's not naturally conductive, you can code it. A lot of times if you see images of bugs and things that have been taken with scanning electron microscope, people have carefully um, prepared to prep those samples to go into the SEM. And so they've done something like what you see down here to this insect, where they put it in an evaporator, a sputter coder like the one here, and they code it with a metal. Oftentimes the metal that they use is gold um, because gold doesn't rust or tarnish and it has a very high atomic number which is good for SEM imaging. Okay, um, another thing, another consequence of using electrons is that an electron beam has to be directed uh, from the source of the electrons down to the sample and it has to travel some distance um, before it can get there. Now, an electron beam wouldn't have a very long mean free path in air um, because the electrons are smaller than the air molecules and it would run into an air molecule and just scatter right off. And so it would be very quickly scattered um, if you tried to do it in ambient conditions. And that's why your scanning electron microscopes are going to be under vacuum. The degree of vacuum will depend upon what kind of source you're using for your electrons. Some of them have more rigorous requirements for vacuum than others, but all of them have some kind of vacuum requirement. Okay, and this is so that the electrons can make it from the source to the sample without scattering. A vacuum also kind of limits what kind of samples that you can put in an SEM. It's very difficult, for example, to put liquids in, an, in a vacuum system. Um, the liquid will just boil off and evaporate, and it'll stick all over the walls of your chamber. You'll have a dirty vacuum system, which is really bad. There's ways to get around that, too. There's some folks out there these days that have constructed special liquid cells for SEM. Um, it does, however, limit to a certain extent your resolution. Certain things are limited. There's disadvantages, and they can be kind of costly. Um, so for the most part, you have to think when you're using an SEM, no liquids. Some organics are not going to work. For example, never ever say, hmm, I wonder what this bar of chocolate looks like, and stick it inside your vacuum system. That's a really good way to make the tech in charge of the SEM really angry with you. So just a little tip from me to you. So I discussed charging a little bit already. Um, when you're doing uh, imaging in an SEM, sometimes you will get sample charging. Even if you've done certain steps in your sample prep, sometimes they might not be quite good enough. What charging looks like in an SEM is looks kind of wavery and distorted. It can also look very bright or very dark, um, it, depending on what kind of charging you've got, and uh, make, make it look like your image is out of focus. So you can reduce charging effects. There's way to get, ways to get around that. You can reduce charging by lowering the energy of your incident electron beam, um, by dropping your accelerating voltage for your electrons, by lowering your beam current. There's ways to get around it and minimize charging. Um, or you can go to an environmental SEM where you raise the background vacuum pressure inside the chamber and that can help um, you know, release some of the charge uh, and allow your sample not to get all charged up. Your bright images in your charging, the brightness is caused if you have a negative charge um, on your sample. So your incoming beam comes in, it sees that negative charge and it reflects a lot more electrons before it gets um, uh, to the sample and so you'll see really bright regions when you have negative charge and you'll see really dark regions when you have a positive charge because your electrons will come in, they'll hit the sample and then they won't escape, they'll be sucked in. Okay, so that looks dark on an SEM image. Other consequences of using a vacuum. Um, vacuum systems require things to be super clean. Uh, so anytime you're working on anything that goes inside of a vacuum chamber, you don't want to have dirty hands or even just regular old hands that you put lotion on or any kind of thing like that. The oil from your hands then gets on the um, stuff that goes inside the vacuum system and then your vacuum system has to really struggle because those oils will come off, move into the chamber and mess up your vacuum. Okay. So that's why you have to use non-powdered latex gloves um, when touching anything that's going to go inside of the chamber, um, even when you're changing samples or whatever when you're doing SEM. You also have to make sure that the samples that you put in the SEM are clean and not dusty. Sometimes you'll see these little compressed air canisters you want to give your uh, sample a little spray off. You never want to take a part straight out of an engine that's got oil on it or anything like that and put it directly in the SEM. That's a good way to contaminate your vacuum system. So you have to just make sure 
that everything that goes in the SEM is as clean as possible. You also don't want to eat or sneeze or anything like that around the SEM when it's open, okay? Once it's closed and pumped down, it's fine. Nothing can get in there. Uh, but before you do that, you want to make sure that you're careful. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit about how <clears throat> scanning electron microscopes work. Now, I'm only going to discuss sort of the, the basic idea and the most common, um, most common electron sources. So the most common electron source is basically just a light bulb filament, right? You have a tungsten filament, basically and you pass a current through that tungsten filament. In response, the filament heats up, and because it's heating up, that heat gives some of the valence electrons enough energy to be freed and get kicked off. This is called thermionic emission. This is um, an image of what some typical SEM tungsten filaments look like. You can see they've been bent into a V or a sharp point, and that helps to collimate the beam and get it going um, out and away. Also, you might remember that when you pass a current through your electric field, is usually highest at sharpest points, and that's going to be where you get the majority of your electrons emitted from. Okay. Now, once the electrons are created, they're accelerated away from the filament by an applied voltage to pull them down towards the sample. Typically, this goes up to um, 30,000 volts or so in an SEM, and you can vary the voltage. In most SEMs, you can vary the voltage through that range to get whatever desired effect you want. So, for example, if you're trying to avoid charging, you might drop your accelerating voltage down to, say, 5,000 volts or something like that. Whereas if you're trying to um, get x-rays out of the source and want to do uh, chemical identification by the x-rays that are emitted, you might want to you know, jack that voltage up so that you get all the x-rays that you need to look at. So the, the voltage is variable in SEMs. And so you can see here, this is a little schematic. You have a filament here, and then there's a voltage applied in between um, the source of the electrons here and an anode, and that accelerates the electrons away from the filament. Okay, once the um, electrons get away from the filament and they've got, they're up to speed, then they pass through a series of magnetic lenses. Now, um, how many lenses it passes through depends upon, you know, basically how expensive your SEM is and ultimately determines your final spot size and the resolution of the SEM. Okay, so the magnetic lenses are often called condenser lenses because it's condensing the beam down and trying to make it smaller to form it into a spot. Okay. So it can go through typically two, two is typical number um, in a regular old SEM, um, and then through a, a scanning coil or objective lens, which is the final um, bit that focuses the beam. Okay, What you can do is these mag electromagnetic lenses are basically coils of wire, and of course when you pass current through a coil of wire, it generates a magnetic field. And then that magnetic field creates a Lorentz force on the electrons as it moves through, and that bends the path of the electrons to focus it. The SEM images aren't created all at once. What happens is you focus your electron beam down to a spot, and then you scan that spot back and forth across the sample in sort of a rectangular or raster pattern, kind of like an old school television set. Um, so what happens is, as it's scanned through the pattern, the position of the electron beam at various times is taken as the pixel, okay? And then you monitor what signals come out of your SEM at each pixel, generating an intensity map for whatever signal you're looking at and creating the image. Now it's raster scanned. When it's at a faster TV rate, it's too fast for you to notice. Um, but if you want a really nice high quality image, the scan will be slow and it takes several minutes maybe to acquire the image and you can watch it scan through in kind of real time. Um, your scanning coils, by varying the current through those scanning coils with time, that allows you to sort of move the beam where you want it to be moved um, and also to focus. Now, how do the condenser lenses work? Well, basically they're current loops. The current loops create these magnetic fields. The magnetic fields avert, exert the forces on the moving charged particles, the electrons, and then that alters the path in kind of a, a helical mode that you see here, and it'll focus it down to a spot, and then the electrons will go back out. And they usually pass through a couple of these um, condenser lenses in a typical SEM. Okay. Once the um, electron spot 
uh, once the electron beam is focused down to a spot which then strikes the surface, um, the image is created from a number, can be created from a number of different signals. For one thing, your primary electron beam um, then can sometimes, the electrons can just bounce right off the sample, okay? And those are all called backscattered electrons, or BSE. Those are high energy electrons, and then you can use their reflection to generate an, a backscattered electron, or BSE image. So that's one signal that can be looked at. Another really typical signal that people like to uh, look at in an SEM is the secondary electron image. So some secondary electrons are created from the interaction of the beam with the material. These have much lower energy, less than say 100 eV or so, and those are created when the primary electrons hit the surface and knock them loose so they're scattered off. Okay, so those are lower ele energy electrons or secondary electrons. Another typical signal that people look at is x-rays. So the x-rays are created when your primary electrons knock loose um, an electron in the sample that's in a uh, core shell electron, one of the electrons closest to the nucleus. Okay, When one of those is freed, then an upper level valence electron in that same atom will fall in to fill that vacancy. And when that happens for energy conservation reasons, an x-ray is emitted. Okay, These x-rays um, are often characteristic x-rays and you can use them to figure out what the chemical components, what types of atoms you're looking at, whether it be silicon or carbon or whatever else, those have characteristic energies to them and you can use it to um, sort of figure out what the chemical composition of your sample is. The resolution of the SEM, the ultimate resolution, of course, is always cited as the size of the spot that's focused on the sample, but practically sometimes your, your resolution is limited even when your spot size is small by the interaction of the beam with the sample, okay? And that's dictated by what the interaction volume is for the primary beam when it strikes the sample. So here's a little cartoon that shows both large and small um, interaction volumes and what can cause the interaction volume to change. So the volume is dependent upon, first of all, your accelerating voltage. If your electrons, your primary electrons that hit the sample are really high energy, say 30,000 um, volts or so were used to accelerate it, so that those primary electrons are really high energy, then of course those electrons don't just always hit the sample and scatter straight back. They're going to penetrate some distance into the sample, and the distance that they penetrate and wiggle around and they're scattering things um, can be sort of a teardrop shape and much wider and deeper than uh, just your simple little spot. Okay, So it's dependent upon, first of all, your accelerating voltage. Another thing that dictates how big your interaction volume is, is what kind of material you're looking at. If you can imagine, say, the Rutherford gold foil experiment, for example, um, let's say that you have a gold sample right here and your electrons come down. Well, the nucleus of a gold atom looks absolutely huge to an incoming electron. However, the nucleus of a carbon atom would look much smaller, and so the scattering cross-section would be different for low Z materials, low atomic number materials like carbon, than it would be for a high Z material like gold. So the interaction volume for gold would be much smaller because the scattering teardrop um, would be smaller because the electrons would scatter more than they would for carbon, right, if that makes sense. And so for high Z materials, high uh, atomic number of materials, your interaction volume is smaller. And for low Z materials, your interaction volume is larger, all right? This can also generate contrast. You're going to get more scattering um, when you have a high Z material. So you could be looking at, example, uh, for example, a blend material or something, a sample that's not made of a uniform material. So you've got gold, you've got carbon, you've got various things. Well, the gold in the scanning electron microscopy image is going to look brighter because it's going to reflect more electrons than the carbon, which will look darker. And so you can get contrast in an image, bright versus dark, um, not just on your topography, but also for what kind of material you're looking at. So that's useful.
Now, like we said earlier, the image is created by scanning the electron beam across the sample and then monitoring what signals come out at each pixel. Now, you tell the computer or your control electronics or whatever the image size you want, like how big the scan should be in micrometers or nanometers, for example. And you also tell it what resolution you want, so you tell it the number of pixels that you get from each image. And then for each pixel, the signals come from the detectors. The brightness of each pixel is dependent upon the strength of the signal that's coming from the detector. So for example, for a secondary electron signal, the brightness corresponds to the number of secondary electrons generated. You get brighter for more electrons and darker for fewer. Electron microscopy images are always going to be grayscale images, and any color that's added to the images is false color or an artistic interpretation. So for example, here on the right, this is a false color SEM image of the blood clot. Somebody got the intensity map and then went back in with Photoshop or something and put in a red color for the blood, right, for the red blood cells, because they wanted the blood to be red. But in reality, of course, it would just be a, a black and white image based on the contrast, based on the number of electrons that come out. Now, secondary electron microscopy images that you see um, are mostly what you see for SCM images. Um, these images are pretty easy for people to interpret. I mean, people even the lay people can look at SEM images and understand what they're looking at because they give mainly topographical information. And so it's kind of like looking at a black and white image from a regular camera, for example. So the changing slope of the sample actually alters the number of secondary electrons that come out, and that's why you get that topographical information. So for example, here in the cartoon, if you have a flat area, there's your interaction volume. The secondary electrons are emitted throughout the volume, but they have these paths that kind of go in all directions. Well, the ones that are closest to the surface make it out and therefore go to the detector, and the ones that are deeper in, maybe they don't make it out. And you can see that on a slope, right, on a slope, more electrons are going to be making it out. If it's facing the detector, they'll get even more out. And so that kind of gives you a contrast. On high slope areas, it looks bright if it's facing the detector, and it might look dark if it's over here on the other side of the detector, so it looks like shading. Okay, so it's pretty easy to interpret that. Okay, speaking of detectors, um, if you look inside a typical um, SEM, you can see all the detectors that come from the various signals, okay? So here, this is the pole piece. This is where the electrons actually are coming out. They come out of that little pinhole right there. And then you can see the other detectors inside. This right here is the backscattered electron detector, okay? And what you would do is you would just move that over into place over your sample between the pole piece and the sample if you wanted to use it. There's also an ever Hart Thornley secondary electron detector that's right here, an X-ray detector that's right here. There's a little chamber scope, usually on the inside of SEMs, you want to be able to see inside the chamber, and so they have a little infrared camera that's set up to take a little movie and video so you can make sure your sample's positioned correctly. And then there's also vacuum gauges to make sure that you're at pressure. So that's kind of what the inside of a typical SEM might look like. Secondary electron detectors are the most common, and so I wanted to go over a little bit how they work. They're called, most of them, Everhart Thornley detectors, and they're used to detect and amplify the signal of secondary electrons. Basically what it is, if you're familiar with this at all, it's basically a scintillator hooked up to a photomultiplier tube, so that's all it is. So what they do is they have a, usually a small cage around the outside of the detector, and they apply a small positive voltage to the cage. The small positive voltage might range uh, up to, say, 300 volts. Actually, you could bias the cage from negative 50 volts up to 300 volts in many SEMs, um, depending on whether you want to attract those secondary electrons to the detector or repel them to the de from the detector so that um, you... Uh, you have basically a backscattered image, okay, so you can do that as well. So that small positive voltage is what you use most of the time, and that pulls the electrons emitted from the sample towards the detector so that you get more signal out and you have a brighter, uh, more intense image. If the sample slope is tilted away from the detector, though, even with the small attractive voltage, not all of them are going to make it, and that causes that shading effect. So the placement of the detector inside of the chamber is something that any good SEM operator should remember. Um, and it, it kind of 
looks like a light source um, from a typical black and white image. And so when your brain looks at this, what they, what your brain interprets in this image of uh, shuttle tiles, for example, is that there's a sun or some sort of light on this side of the image, and then the darkness or the shadow is over here. So your brain interprets that as light sources over here. What it really means, though, when you're looking at a secondary electron image is detectors over here, right? That's what it means. So an Everhart Thornley detector, um, you can read more about this in many sources, um, but I'm just going to go over the basics of how it works. The scintillator and the photomultiplier tube, I told you are the two main parts of the Everhart Thornley detector. The scintillator is basically a thin plastic disc that's coated with some phosphorescent material that's efficient at converting the energy contained in the electrons into ultraviolet light photons. And the photons travel down that light pipe to a photomultiplier tube and that amplifies the signal. The photoelectrons actually strike a photocathode that converts those ultraviolet photons back into electrons electrons, and then the electrons are accelerated towards these various dynodes. So um, when they strike the first dynode, they emit more electrons, and then those electrons are accelerated towards a second dynode, and so forth. So the dynodes are coated with a material with a high electron yield so that you get at least two and sometimes as many as ten electrons emitted from each diode each time it strikes, and the result is you get a cascade of electrons multiplying the signal um, that eventually strike the anode. So you have a single photon, for example, producing a million final electrons that's measured as a current. So that's kind of how it works. X-ray detectors are also really common on many research scanning electron microscopes. They're great for spectroscopy and compositional analysis of your samples, and so a lot of SEMs have this capability. They're pretty easy to identify because they're these big things that are hanging off the side of your SEM. Okay, so this is your X-ray detector right here in this image. Um, your X-ray uh, spectra typically looks something like this, and there's been a lot of work to catalog where all these peaks are are from the various elements and so you scan in you take it you take a spectrum and then you uh, have your software automatically output for example hey the peak that you see at this energy is an oxygen k alpha peak and the peak that you see at this energy is an iron k alpha peak and so you can compositionally uh, identify your sample by by using um, the x-ray um, the electromagnetic lenses are kind of interesting to think about, especially if you compare them to how lenses work in typical optical microscopes, which people might be more familiar with. So, for example, when you focus an electron microscope, what you're doing is you're changing the current that runs through that objective lens, okay, um, so that you can change the magnetic field strength. And what happens is when you change your magnetic field strength via the Lorentz force law, F is equal to QB cross B, right? If you change B, if you make B larger, that makes your force larger, which bends the electrons more, and then you have a, uh, a focal spot that's closer to the lens, okay? So let's say that your sample is this line right here in this little image. If you have your current too strong through your lens, then the um, spot is focused to a place somewhere above your sample and you're out of focus. Or if it's perfect, that spot is in its smallest point right when it hits the sample. Or if the current is too weak in the lens, the magnetic field's not strong enough, then the focal point would be somewhere below your sample and it would also be out of focus. And so what you do when you sit down at an SEM is you dial the knob, changing the current until the image looks in focus to you. So that's how you focus in an SEM. Now, in an optical microscope, this is an interesting contrast. In an optical microscope, when you change your magnification, you're actually changing the lens, right? So if you've ever worked with an optical microscope, you have various objectives, and those objectives have certain strengths. So you might have a four times lens, a 10 times lens, or a 100 times lens, for example. And that means that when you change your magnification, you've changed the focal length of your lens, and so you need to refocus. In an SEM, that's not the case. When you change the magnification in the SEM, you're just changing the scan 
hand size that you're looking at. Okay, so that's all. If I say I want to look at a uh, 50 nanometer wide rectangle, for example, then that's a certain magnification. If I say I want to look at a 500 nanometer wide rectangle, that's a certain magnification. So what you're doing there is you're changing the scanning coils current through the scanning coils and you're figuring out what your magnification is that way. However, the focus is controlled by a different lens and it's just basically where does the spot end up, okay? So in optical microscopy, when you focus, you're changing the position of the sample. You're moving your sample up and down to correspond to where the focal point for that lens is. In SEM, you're changing the focal length of the lens itself. So you set the focal length of your um, condenser lens and you say, boom, there I am. I'm in focus right there. Now I'm just going to move my beam back and forth. Okay, so that's kind of how that works. All right, so that's some SEM basics. Your book contains probably a lot more information than that, so if you're more interested in SEM, you can get more information by reading in Chapter 3 of your textbook. Also, if you found this really interesting and you'd like to learn more about electron microscopy and other advanced microscopies, we offer a full course at this university on how to operate an SEM that has a really great attached lab to it, and so you can get up to speed on how to do all that. And I highly encourage anyone really interested in nanoscience to take that course and become more familiar in a hands-on way with the tools of uh, nanoscience. Okay, you can also find more about from these helpful links right here. Um, there's movies, there's overview papers, and in-depth coverage at these links. Um, and I look forward to uh, seeing you around campus or in class or in my office. Thank you.